Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Wednesdays at the Center, hosted by the John Hope Franklin Center and the Duke University Center for International and Global Studies. Today, we are pleased to welcome UNC Professor Mark Driscoll for a talk titled Blacks Weather, Whites Climate. Please remember to keep your microphone muted and to submit questions and comments in the chat. Now I invite Professor Driscoll for his introductory remarks. Thank you. Rahini, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the John Hope Franklin Center for hosting um, my talk yet again. Um, and also I'd like to acknowledge that I am on Okanichi Band Saponi Nation territory um, where I am in Carborough, North Carolina. And also I teach at, a, at the University of North Carolina, uh, Chapel Hill, which was built, the original built buildings are all constructed by um, enslaved black labor and professors owned slaves in the 1830s, 1840s and 1850s at UNC Chapel Hill. So just wanted to lay, lay that out there at the beginning. Um, okay, um, I'm gonna begin here and just to let, let people know that I have more information than I can speak. So I'm gonna let you all read some things that I'm not, I won't have time to actually um, articulate to voice and um, I'll just jump right in here. Okay, on May 5th, 2020, I went to what I call a far white protest in downtown Raleigh called by a group um, Reopen North Carolina. Reopen was forced to oppose the restrictions on businesses and Christian services mandated to control the spread of COVID-19. Um, so here's, a, here's orange skin, no mask here, a version of white skin, no mask. And this phenomenon could also extend into be calling orange, white, and blue. So these protests beginning at the end of April 20, 2020, um, with financial support from Republican backers attracted between 200 and 600 people. And North Carolina is an open carry state. So some of the protesters brought weapons to these, uh, these actions. Um, the energy of these kind of protests inspired more heavily armed groups like Boogaloo, Boogaloo Boys to show up to attract members to its platform of race war. Um, Boogaloo Boys have been kicked off of Facebook for inciting violence, one of the only groups that Facebook has kicked off. So North Carolina race war, white race warriors organized under the name of Blue Igloo. Um, I asked people there, I've, I've become somewhat of an ethnographer of the far white here in North Carolina. I asked people, why aren't any of you wearing face coverings? And these were some of the responses. You all can read these. Rebels don't wear masks. I think very predictable are responses. Also that white people didn't get COVID, only black people got COVID. Now, at the exact same place, Six weeks later, May 30th, 2020, I was at a, another protest, a Day of Justice protest for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. These were global protests. There were about a thousand people present, approximately half of them black. Everyone has some form of mask on. In dramatic counterpoint to the far white protesters, nonchalant about infecting other people and getting sick themselves, these racial justice activists were demonstrably chalant are concerned for victims of police violence and conscientious about not infecting others. How did this racialized divergence emerge? So I'm gonna to try to present you with some of the um, conclusions, some of the things that I've been researching the last two years. Here's a picture from that same day of justice rally in downtown Raleigh. You can see almost everyone's wearing some kind of face covering. Um, okay, black weathering. African-Americans twice as likely to get COVID-19 and three times more likely to die. Arlene Geronimus proposed a weathering hypothesis to explain negative health outcomes for black mothers when compared to white mothers. Weathering usually refers to the breaking down of rocks and wood through exposure to the Earth's atmosphere. Geronimus chose the word to reference the cumulative biospheric racism experienced by black women in particular and African-Americans generally, which, which she saw leading to conditions varying from maternal death to premature heart uh, and lung disease. 
among many other people, Linda Villarosa, the journalist, um, deployed Geronimus's weathering hypothesis to frame the preventable loss of black life in and around New Orleans in spring 2020. Okay, now black weathering, what I'm doing in this new book project is to insist is a dialectical corollary to white climating or the blithe plundering and polluting of lo local and global critical, critical zones, which is the word that uh, some earth scientists are proposing to replace ecology. I'm insisting the critical zones be called critical race zones. And you'll see why as, as I go along. Contemporary climate breakdown, climate, climate change, climate catastrophe is still largely construed in what Crenshaw calls intersectional modalities. Now, native and black ecology scholars like uh, Justin Hosby and um, Taya Miles have adam adamantly refused this. And these are some of the canonical texts that people are using to, um, to flesh out this large scale refusal. Um, I'm calling this world race ecology. Obviously, this is a tweaking of Jason Moore's world ecology. And the way I'm, I'm framing world race ecology is it builds off the way pollution credit in debits are race specific. And environmental racism is not intersected by class and wealth. In other words, water and oxygen have centers and peripheries. Greenhouse emissions similarly have racialized metropoles and colonies. So that's a world race ecology tweaking of world systems theory um, that a bunch of us have been working on, Jason Moore in particular. Now, I'm going to begin this. Um, I'm going to begin this with Francis Bacon, in particular, who is considered by some people a father, a confounding father of the scientific racism. In particular, his utopian novel from 1625, New Atlantis, I think is, is crucial. Just very, very skeletally, the plot is, goes like this a crew of Spanish sailors a shipwreck on an island colonized by English settlers called Ben Salem. The leader of the Spanish is then led around the islands by one of the governor. These people are really overseers of Ben Salem. The ruling masters are called fathers based on Bacon's own inflated self-image. They're an aristocratic group of philosopher scientists who have absolute power and what I call extra active authority over everything from the common people to weather events. They live completely isolated and rely on the governors to act as overseers. Bacon was a lifelong advocate of plantation colonialism. Here's Bacon in 1619. Now, the Salomon House, the research facility that these father scientists work at, was the basis for the Royal Society established by the Bacon protege, Robert Boyle. So this isn't mere fiction here. Um, now, the father scientists work in the Salomon House Research Campus, conducting experiments with the ultimate purpose of what Bacon calls upgrading or improving nature. The Spanish narrator is granted an interview with the father, which coincides with the first visit to the city from any father in 12 years. It's a very regal entrance. The father comes into the city pulled by um, horses and a gold chariot surrounded by uh, 50, 50 some attendants. The narrator comments, comments on how passive and expressionless the commoners are in the face of this, uh, this regal presence. He describes them as standing passively um, at, like soldiers, as if, as, if, as if they had been placed there. I, I argue that this is like the stage plantation visits in the antebellum South that fooled a lot of people into thinking that prison planters were um, um, paternalistic. The father scientists practice Baconian induction on everything from the soils to the water, air currents, and mountains on the island. This is one of the quotes from New Atlantis. The extensive penetrations into nature that the scientists are practicing, what earth scientists today call anthroturbation, on Ben Salem have turned the physical environment completely inside out. Bacon writes in the new organon, which he offered as a replacement for Aristotle's organon, as the, the, the playbook for, uh, for, for science. 
the road of induction leads to superinduction. In other words, Bacon isn't just talking about induction. Induction is a means to the ends of a complete transformation of more than human nature. All the flora, fauna, and minerals have been extracted from their original dependence in a critical zone and then replaced by the father scientists. So I'll just you, let you all read some of this stuff, but they're doing experiments on everything, cloud cover, mountains, um, the soil, stratosphere, pedosphere, all kinds of things um, here. And what's, what, I, what I think is important is the father scientist can create weather events ex nihilo. The father explains, we have great and spacious houses where we imitate and demonstrate meteors as snow, hail, rain. Some artificial rains of bodies and not just of water, thunder, lightning. So they can throw bodies and mountains into the air and, uh, and back again like alchemists. The father scientist brags to the Spanish narrator about Salomon House's multiple kinds of furnaces where they can burn fossil fuels and minerals and suggests that they've intuited the relationship between greenhouse gases and climate change. What I'm saying is this is the, this is the, this is the emergence of climating white people. Again, New Atlantis isn't just a mere utopian novel. It reinscribes Bacon's policy briefs to the Virginia and Newfoundland colonies. He was an investor in uh, the, the Virginia colony. Now, the question that I have for New Atlantis, that as far as I know, has not been asked by the scholars working on Bacon. If I'm wrong about that, pl pl please help me out. Um, the question is, are these commoners on Ben Salem uh, are they enslaved? Um, for instance, women are forced to have 10 plus children and male and female commoners are absolutely subordinate to the overseer seers, govern, governors. No one can leave Ben Salem except for the fathers. Kimberly Hale has argued that Ben Salem commoners can be killed or severely punished for disobeying the commands of the overseers. Hale comes close, but no scholar that I'm aware of suggests that these colonists, commoners are enslaved on Ben Salem. This is surprising because Bacon wrote explicitly about slavery in several places and always justified it. In his first book, this is a breakthrough book in the scientific revolution, The Advancement of Learning. He assumes the position of an older teacher instructing his younger male students on how to confront more than human nature. This is what he says. He says, I urge you to to see me as a slave trader, quote, in fact, providing to you nature with children in tow as a slave to use as you see fit. Carolyn Merchant, of, of course, has, has, um, has elaborated on this in a brilliant way in her death of, of nature. Now, in this pronouncement of black, what I, I'm insisting that this is part of blacks, weather, whites, climate, instrumentalizing nature as a master would his enslaved humans, Bacon's lecture continues, ensure success at extending the atrociously narrow limits of man's domination of the universe to their promised expanse. Du Bois called this ideology white people's title deed to the universe. Bacon was very clear that European men are superior to all other kinds of human beings. Um, and so he wrote explicitly about this. Again, this has been almost completely elided in the Bacon scholarship. There are exceptions for sure, very important exceptions that, that inspired my research here. So we said European man is a god to all of the humans in the world. Now, it's important Bacon praised conquerors and colonizers, like Columbus, for using scientific rationality to explain what he, be he believed, this is Columbus, believed he could discover new lands beyond the already known, reasons which afterwards were vindicated by his experiment and caused events of vast consequence. He, he could have said that again. Now, what I'm, 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 I'm insisting is the scientific revolution, at least in the hands of Bacon, is inextricable for what I'm calling the enslavement revolution that's taking place at the exact same time. Bacon endorsed slavery to people, what he called people, English colonies of the Americas. He justified it in two ways. The first way is that this follows the template established by the great Greek and Roman empires where slavery was completely endemic and accepted. His second justification of slavery came in 
the reading of, of the, the scholastic discussion of this, in particular Aquinas' Lex Charitaris, a law of, law of benevolent enslavement. This emerged from the just war doctrine, Grotius, Locke, etc., which frequently morphed into just enslavement. So the just war doctrine is, it definitely is talking about just war. It also elaborates on when can people be enslaved and when, when can they not be. Bacon specifies this in a, in a piece called An Advertisement Touching on Holy War. And he identifies six populations of potential slaves to be used in the Americas and four are Africans. Now Bacon says Columbus initialized events of vast consequence. And there's a clear celebration in Bacon's work of Spanish conquerors and English settler colonizers. Here I'm drawing on the Orbis spike hypothesis that um, Maslin and Lewis have, have concocted brilliantly, I think, in their 2018 book, where they posit that Iberian conquest killed off 90% of indigenous people, resulting in a rewilding of nature in and around the built environments of the Americas. I challenge anybody to go to Honduras and go to the lost cities. You can see this. So 90% of the indigenous people killed off resulted in a rewilding, reforestation, and an enormous drawdown and sinking of carbon, intensifying the Little Ice Age. This is what uh, La Dirty calls a long, cold 17th century. So we have a, col a colder weather, um, decreasing uh, parts per million of, of, uh, of carbon molecules in the atmosphere. What I'm arguing in this project is the Orbis spike brings the color line into convergence with capitalogenic disruptions to the carbon cycle. So the inextricability of the color line in the carbon cycle emerges right here in the 1610 hypothesis. This white utopia of the new world was a black inferno, so says Sylvia Winter um, correctly. Now climate breakdown, so from 1610, then when we have an increase, we have a scaling and a gradual increase of parts per million of carbon molecules in the atmosphere. This begins, so we have this rewilding process after 90% of the indigenous folks are killed off. Then we have systematic deforestation in the Americas for plantation agriculture. This chainsaw massacre of rewilded ecologies, most of it carried out by enslaved Africans in Brazil, the Caribbean, and Virginia. But deforestation is only the beginning. This is all the beginning of widespread soil and mineral mining, monocropping, and landfilling. Now, again, Bacon and others boil champion, champion these climate change in Columbuses. Now, this intensified Little Ice Age weather arguably played a part in Bacon's death by pneumonia on April, April 9, 1625, offering an addendum to Jonathan Metzl's argument in dying of whiteness. So in other words, what I'm, I'm suggesting here based on Metzl's work is that Bacon contributed to his own death. The unusual amount of snow in London inspired Bacon to conduct experiments on freezing chicken meat, killing him several days later. This is part of Bacon's project to extend some, the lives of some humans. Now I'm gonna jump to what I'm gonna call the second enslavement revolution. Some scholars call it the second slavery in the Americas, in the US in particular. <clears throat> now there's a classic overproduction crisis of, ab of tobacco and sugar resulting in land killing, what Marx calls robber agriculture and intensified black weathering. Thomas Jefferson's Monticello should be seen as a primal scene of this where there's nutrient plundering, widespread nutrient plundering forced Jefferson to diversify into small manufacturers. <clears throat> this was just part of widespread ecological devastation of a slave holding US South, declining soil fertility, flooding, erosion, et cetera. One of the effects of this was what I'm calling a white flight to the new cotton kingdom in Alabama and Mississippi after 1810. Even John C. Calhoun's two sons emigrated to Alabama as soil fertility had been maxed out in South Carolina. The ecological devastation of Jefferson's Monticello, Edmund Ruffin, who was himself a uh, slaveholding um, a farmer, came up, used this word land killing. 
he decried this land killing via tobacco monocropping, which forced warden plant planters to practice shifting agriculture. This is called Sweden agriculture. There are lots of ways to talk about this. But in general, soil fertility was maxed out and the land was abandoned for, for newly cleared and deforested terrain. Deforestation and tobacco monocropping intensified the land, what Dan Richter calls landscape signatures of gullying and widespread erosion at Jefferson's Monticello. This is a, a map, I don't have time to get into this, of uh, the erosion and the gullying that happens at Monticello. Some of this has been covered over and aestheticized with gardens and plants, et cetera. Now, what I'm saying is that this land killing correlates to the primitive accumulation of fossil capital in the US. Some tobacco planters in Virginia couldn't resort to white flight, in other words, go to Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi, but instead started mining coal. The enslaved black labor was shifted from tobacco monocropping to fossil fuel extraction. This is the primitive accumulation of fossil capital. The Morris family in Midlothian County, Virginia, they were the first to shift from tobacco soil mining to coal mining in 1790s. This is the first coal plantation in the world. This is what they called this. This is followed by the Heth family in uh, Hanover County. All of these coal plantations were west and south of Richmond, Virginia. Coal dug, slave dug coal, led domestic production in the US until 1829. There's no Pennsylvania competition. Pennsylvania takes over in 1829, 1830. I just want to underline this, this is very important. Enslaved coal miners were sacrificed to the primitive accumulation of fossil capital in the US it, with, the, with, the, with the, the, the multiplied effects of black, black weathering to, to, to them and their families. Jefferson was a major promoter of Richmond slave dug coal. This is what he says in notes in the states of Virginia. He continued pimping or pushing Virginia coal when he became president in 1801, only using Virginia coal to heat the White House. Um, the US Merchant Marine used primarily Richmond coal until the 1830s. Now here I'm gonna jump quickly and pardon the abrupt segue into Bacon's role in the antebellum US South. He was hugely influential on scientific slave owning planters like Ruffin again in Virginia, James Henry Hammond in South Carolina, and M.W. Phillips in, in Mississippi. Bacon is frequently invoked in the pages of DuBose Review. This is the central um, organ of pro-slavery thought and politics from 1846 to 1864. Baconian induction and superinduction were put forward as a solution to widespread soil depletion and environmental devastation. Pro-slavery ideologues built on Bacon's celebration of European men and intensified it with the awareness that white U.S. enslavers established the first self-reproducing system of black bondage in the Americas. Cartwright, DeBow, and the fourth U.S. president, James Madison, built on Bacon's raising of European men above all other sex-gendered and raced humans. Now, this celebration, of course, elides the brutal reproduction of black bodies via forcing enslaved women to have one child every two years. This was Thomas Jefferson's prescription. But they were incapable of reproducing the land, and soil fertility declined rapidly throughout the plantation south. James Madison, to his credit, saw this at his own prison plantation, Montpelier, um, and he joined some of these ameliorists, these improvers, and said that to, to avoid white flight agriculture, we need to take a scientific approach to land killing and, and uh, nutrient depletion. But Madison's um, critiques of this fell on deaf ears. The Louisiana, Louisiana Purchase allowed Virginia, Maryland, and Carolina slave owning capitalists to repeat the system of black weathering and white climating in the cotton south. Again, Madison saw how uns unsustainable the system was, and this is some of the things that he's saying here. What I'm arguing here is 
Madison says, Madison joins Ruffin, Hammond, other people. <clears throat> White supremacists must recognize environmental limits. They must respect the limits that nature has imposed. To sustain white supremacy based on based on black um, on slavery, Madison intuited that the biosphere was an in intricate interconnect <clears throat> system of interconnected parts. So he comes he comes close to arguing what Lovelock calls a Gaia theory. Madison challenged white supremacists again to become modern. This is what Ruffin argued for 40 years. Ruffin said that the world's highest form of civilization, again, white mastery over the black, over black enslaved people and deanimated nature, needed to realize the intricate feedback mechanism that undergirds all life. So again, this is, this is a picture of Ruffin. He's a famous fire eater, um, pro-slavery ideologue. Now, some of you know this, James Lovelock says Gaia is an intricate feedback system producing life on Earth. But for Ruffin, Madison, and Phillips in Mississippi, Gaia must be white. It has to be a white Gaia. Ruffin argued that a renewed stewardship of nature based on scientific amelioration of plantation agriculture was urgent to maintain soil fertility in the U.S. South and correct land killing. If successful, these improvers said amelioration would demonstrate conclusively that the U.S. Southern prison plantation capitalists owned Gaia. It was, Gaia was theirs. Again, this is Lovelock's superorganism maintaining balance of life on Earth, that Gaia was in effect a white Gaia. So white Gaia is the apogee of civilization. Um, Ruffin's message again fell on deaf ears. What happened with the white flight to, to um, <clears throat> the Cotton Kingdom in Alabama and Mississippi was the same process of land killing and robber agriculture and black weathering. These lands were maxed out. Some of these people moved on to new land in Texas. But however, the point that I want to make is energized by, the, by windfall profits from cotton, a much more exuberant logic of white Gaia emerged in the, in, the, in the deep south and proposed by this person, Samuel Cartwright. Many people have worked on him and um, he was the preeminent specialist in the US South and Negro diseases, just a vile racist um, who came up with all these, um, all these uh, supposed innate um, diseases to, uh, to enslave, enslave blacks. He's responding, Cartwright and others are responding to the critiques of prison plantation ecocide in the U.S. South. And what he's saying, that only people slaveholding scientific whites can understand the character of the Negro and therefore put that character to work to increase productivity, especially agricultural productivity, and reproduce the system of white Gaia. Um, let me see, how much, how much time do I have left? Oh, I think I have some time. Okay. Um, so this is a quote from, from Cart right here. Um, he said that, ne that Negroes, and he also talked about Native Americans, they're incapable of doing anything themselves. They are obliged to move and exercise their muscles when the white man, acquainted with their character, wills that they should do so. So he's talking about white White will is something that needs to be instilled into enslaved workers, not by the whip or by the chain, just by the pure power of white will. Here's another quote from, uh, from Cartwright, which he says, no other compulsion is necessary to make them perform their daily tax, tasks than his white will be done. It is not the whip, as many suppose, which calls forth these muscular exertions, the result of which is sugar, cotton, breadstuffs, rice, and tobacco. These are the products of the white man's will, acting through the muscles of the prognathous race of our southern states. If we were to withdraw and the plantations handed over as gracious gifts to the laborers, agricultural labor would cease for want of the spiritual power called up by the will, the white will, to move these machines, the muscles. 
Um, so anyway, I'll let, you, I'll let you all read the rest of that. He says, this is like the satellites of Jupiter. White will is like the satellites of Jupiter revolving around a, sup a superior magnetism of, um, so again, this is, this is an example of what I'm calling this white Gaia. Cartwright is saying that the cosmos itself is moved by white male will. Cartwright is no outlier. He's drawing on his reading of Immanuel Kant for this. To be fair to Kant, just for a second, although Kant didn't go as far as Cartwright in endowing Euro males with divine capacities, he was the intellectual pioneer for white guy in his, in, with his celebration of will. Excuse me for a second here. In a, a well-known essay in 1788 on the use of teleological principles in philosophy, Kant says that only Europeans from cold weather environments were suitable for any climate. Europe, European men could go anywhere in the world and prosper and make things more productive. What Kant meant by this is that white people could regenerate anywhere using their reason and will to oversee more than human nature and extra European humans. If they could survive in cold and wet weather environments, then Euro whites could take those traits, evolve from their dispositions anywhere, and not only survive, but thrive. And this is one of Kant's um, definitions of progress. Okay. Kantian philosophy promoted black weathering, white climating, not enlightenment philosophy. I'm calling this enlightenment philosophy. Kant referenced the increased global movement of people in the late 18th century, and he was trying to make sense of this, saying that all the races will extinguish except that of the whites. This is what I've been inspired by John Harfouche's, I think, brilliant book called Another Mind-Body Problem. This built on his comments in the late 1770s that, quote, we find people who do not appear to progress in the perfection, the perfection of human nature. Rather, they have come to a standstill while others, as in Europe, always progress. I'm sorry, there's a typo there. Okay, white European overseers of non-European and flora zvek or purpose. So Kant's saying that all natural things have a purpose and he's critiquing Newtonian mechanics. Um, he says that we have to accept Newtonian mechanics to a certain extent, but then we have to bring in this other thing that goes beyond mechanics. It is quite literally a cosmic principle of white male will. Um, okay. Um, again, only Europeans from cold weather environments were suitable for any climate. Um, and he, he says that all the races have original predispositions. To prove this, Kant looks around Germany and France and says, look at the South Asians, he called them gypsies, and Black Africans who come to Europe, and they're all weathering. They're, ex they're becoming extinct as a people. So people from war warm climates always weather and degenerate when they come to cold ones. Just the opposite, people who come from cold climates, Europeans is all Kant's referencing that, they, they have the ability to prosper in warmer climates. And this is a phrase that Kant, Kant challenges us to think about. Where have Indians and Negroes attempted to expand into Northern regions? He said that these people, the only, their real purpose, the purpose that nature has given them is to be servants to enslave people of white men. He says this very specifically. So Kant talks about the insatiable desire to possess, possess or even to dominate only works towards progress when Europeans alone are granted this power over nature and all humans. Again, I'm insisting that Kant should be um, one of the first theorists of white Gaia, um, or whites climating, blacks weathering. This is Kant as a theorist of black weathering. Um, I'll let you all read that. And um, I think I'd, I just prefer to stop there and um, invite your questions or especially criticisms. And thank you all for listening and thank you all for showing up today.
Thank you, Professor Driscoll. And uh, just a reminder, you can either submit your questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask directly, Professor Driscoll. One just came up. Um, awesome. Yes, yeah, so fascinating and inspiring. Thank you. I'm currently working on the history of nice soil and toilets in modern China. You helped me understand white cultures disgust on Chinese farming practices in new ways. You mentioned one man, Ruffin, question mark, who argued for fertilizing the land rather than abandon it to exploit new land. And he was totally ignored. Can you please say more about this? Was he a total outlier? Uh, the question were... is from Nicole Barnes, sorry. N Nicole, how are you? Thank you for the question. Hi, Nicole. Thank you so much Hi. for coming. Hi, um, thank you. Nicole, great to hear from you. Um, um, Nicole is also, Nicole, Nicole, this is a great question. Edmund Ruffin, um, Nicole, there are three or four improvers or, or meliorists who are insisting, again, their point, it's a desperate cry to um, white slave home holding um, um, plantation capitalists that they need to, they need to look at the ecological limits on, on what they're doing. Um, not, Ruffin was not concerned with the impacts of what they were doing to black bodies at all. He was just concerned with soil nutrients and maintaining them. A little bit about trees, a little bit about the, a, a little bit about, a little bit about an ecological approach that Ruffin had. Nicole, there were other people who had this. Um, again, the, who's considered the second most important person in terms of this uh, pro-slavery amelioration? And again, a lot of this is inspired by, by Baconian induction. Is a person named M. W. Phillips who was in uh, Mississippi, who had his own plantation and was uh, and owned sixty to eighty slaves, um, enslaved people. He conducted experiments on different seeds and different types of soil. So there were three or four people, um, but for the most part, um, their kind of cries for improvement fell on deaf ears. Wonderful, thank you. And if I could just ask a quick follow-up question to that. Sure. I think I saw Ruffin talking more about guano or other sort of, um, like basically they're not advocating for the use of night soil, correct? Nicole, that's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Ruffin's talking about green manure and a uh, marl and the bones of, of, of you know, dead, dead, uh, dead fauna, um, including humans. Wow. So Ruffin was, 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 was for using human bones as fertilizer. I mean, this is an amazing, um, you know, nutrient cycle, right, is what he's offering. Yeah. I mean, Nicole, some of these people are using animal manure, but it was considered too expensive and too much of a hassle for most of the Southern um, um, prison plantation capitalists. Mm, okay, thank you so much. This is You're really welcome. Good. Thank you for the question, Nicole. Yeah. And we have a raised hand from Miguel Rojas Sotelo. You can go, Miguel. Oh. Thank you, Professor Driscoll. Always uh, a pleasure to hear you. Uh, you're a very compelling and, and um, activist kind of, of uh, academic uh, research. My question is, is regarding to um, your interactions with uh, theories uh, that I think are very parallel to what is uh, happening in, in this new text from anthropology that are the theories of of Quijano and the uh, uh, modern and uh, colonial uh, working group and, and the issues of decoloniality, right? Because I think they go hand into hand to many of, of, of your black uh, weathering and white uh, climate, climating, uh, right? The idea of, of America as the new model for global power uh, and uh, the creation of the idea of race as a, a mental uh, category of modernity connected to the idea of reason and the enlightenment, uh, the development of capitalism as a new structure for control of labor and of nature, of course, uh, the idea of coloniality of power and global capitalism and, and as the hegemonic way to whitening 
different uh, Eurocentrification uh, that is connected with the idea of coloniality and war capitalism. Uh, and uh, my, yeah, my interest in is how you are uh, interacting and discussing uh, within that tradition of Latin American critical theory that had taken you know, a, a look into, into these same issues. Miguel, thank you for the question. This is fantastic. Um, Miguel, this is um, modernity coloniality stuff has been absolutely um, a formative for me. Um, you know, my, my closest friend over here in, uh, in Orange County is Arturo Escobar. So I learned so much from, he had a seminar with, Mignolo, with Walter Mignolo um, for four or five years that was um, completely groundbreaking for me um, when I first came to North Carolina to teach. Um, so um, Miguel, thank you for reminding me on that. I'm realizing that I don't have enough references to their work. Um, especially Grossvogel's work that I love, um, but that's not to not to downplay Quijano or uh, or. But anyway, Miguel, just to say, I mean, Escobar has been the main interlocutor uh, uh, with me for this work. Uh, there's been nobody who's engaged with it at that level. There are two other there are other important people, but I've talked to him uh, at length with this, and he's been very. Um, formative on this project. So um, anyway, thank you for reminding me of that. And Miguel, I'll just apologize for not being clearer about my indebtedness to the modernity, modernity coloniality paradigm. Well, thank you so much for your humility too. Miguel, no, thank you for the reminder. My God, this is just great. Um, uh, now we have a a uh, question slash comment from Anne Maria Makulu. Awesome. This is really great. This is really great, Mark. I particularly appreciated appreciate the relationship you articulate environmental ecological terms, the relationship between white supremacy and manifest destiny, a new angle, and once you think about it, an essential one. More of a comment than a question, but perhaps you have more to say. And Maria, thank you. This is, uh, I really appreciate it. And Maria, I don't think I have actually anything more to say. Um, I think this is about all I've come up with to this point. Um, uh, yeah, I hate to cite myself. I just think my last book is a failure at so many levels, but I tried to, um, um, again, lay out some of these things and using this conceit I'll, I call um, climate Caucasianism. Uh, that I was very unsuccessful with um, in my last book on 19th century on a climate Caucasianism in, uh, in East Asia, in Japan and China, and um, kind of frustrated with um, my failures uh, in that project. I just wanted to um, try to think of um, different things to try to develop that in um, more convincing ways. So kind of what I'm doing, it was uh, actually very easy to, I mean, not easy, but for me here in North Carolina with the great libraries at UNC and Duke are some of the best, um, best collections of archival material on, um, on plantation capitalism. So I've been taking advantage of both of those libraries um, in the last two years to do more, more research actually on some of the stuff that I'm talking about here on blacks weathering and whites climating. And I know probably some of this sounds like a lot of theory, but this really comes from empirical place comes from an archival place where I'm looking at, for instance, Ruffin's own plantation records, M.W. Phillips' own plantation records, and what they were saying about the connection between um, what they're doing in black bodies. I mean, oftentimes they're denying the connection, but they at least are um, um, putting that out there. So, um, so anyway, so thank you for the comment. Um, I don't really, I don't think at this point I have really a lot more to say about this, um, but I'm thankful for you all to be here to engage with this. And um, Amory, I want to hear what you think about this. Actually, I want you all to give me um, um, ideas about where this should go and um, um, kind of like Miguel already has. But anyway, I don't think I have anything more to say except that... Um, Amory, you can help me um, extend this project to Africa, of course, that 
blacks weathering, whites climating isn't just a U.S. or a, or a U.S. and Caribbean plus Brazil project. This is a global project um, that happens in many places in the world. So not just the North and the Mid-Atlantic, but happens in the Indian Ocean, happens in many other places. So I guess that's the new, really the new empirical research I'm, uh, I'm going to start uh, start carrying out after after the holiday season. Can I um, just make a, a quick response? This is great, Mark, and maybe you and I can have a chat on Friday. <laughs> great. But uh, in the meantime, yeah, if, if you're talking about extending to the African continent, I mean, the one thing that really occurs to me is, it sounds very old fashioned, but um, the relationship between under development or undevelopment and development, right, in, in the history of capitalist modernity. Absolutely. And very architected, intentional ways that um, certainly in places like South Africa, but really across the continent, uh, colonial administrators and um, other, other folk really architected, I'm making a horrible word here, but um, by design created ecological devastation <laughs> for the purposes of drawing people into um, the orbit of early industrial and other kinds of production. And so in that sense, the sort of environmental or ecological angle on, oh, look, we're going to try and get uh, people to overgraze by dispossessing them of land and then um, driving an agenda that is is a, an agenda for modernity and, and definitely for extending the, the colonial frontier precisely through ecological devastation. I mean, quite, quite by design. Yes, and Maria, thank you. Yeah, that's clearer than what I said. That's fantastic, exactly by design. And Maria, I would just add that there are, this design is working on two different levels. So kind of what I want to insist on is this is a, this is a, class project of white capital, white colonizing capital, that then becomes something much bigger. How that becomes much bigger to encompass all people identified as white is a, is a question that I think I have to deal with. And Maria, what, the way that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this right now is that there are two different classes of white men. I'm using this in explicitly Baconian terms. There are inducers or scientific planners, and then there are super inducers. Those are overseers, or what we, we would today call site managers. So the way that this class project trickles down to a proletarian white people, non-property owning white people, is through this crucial category of the overseer. That's the real globalization of this project. These working class men take on this project and disseminate a logic of progress slash ecocide. Um, so anyway, that's thank you for um, for your comments. It's just fantastic. Exactly, it is by design. I completely agree with you. But the but but these people, the designers, the the, the content writers, the scientists, the planners, they're not the ones actually on the ground carrying it out. Who's on the ground carrying it out? A, a different class of white men is crucial for the for the globalization of climate Caucasianism. Thank you, Professor. We have a raised hand from Kristen Stapleton. Hi. Um, thanks very much for the talk. I I logged in because Nicole Barnes uh, drew my attention to this talk. Uh, she came and spoke with my graduate seminar here in Buffalo. And uh, I, I mentioned to her that I was planning to assign the introduction to your most recent book to the, my seminar students, and we're talking about it on Monday, this coming Monday. So I thought I'd log in and hear, um, hear what you had to say about what looks like a new project. But since you just mentioned that you found your last books disappointing, you were disappointed with it, I thought I'd ask you, um, you know, what what you found disappointing. I, I have to say, I reviewed it for a journal and I said it was stimulating, but not entirely convincing. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm curious, and particularly in light of this new project where you um, divide everything between white and black, it's seemingly, it, it's focused on the Atlantic world, so I see that, but I don't understand how East Asia is gonna fit into this. And maybe you could say something about that. 
uh, given that you know the expansion of Europeans and this climate colonialism, as you pointed out, went to East Asia pretty early, and a lot of Chinese people got very involved in it. Maybe you see them as overseers or compradors, but a lot of them actually found it exciting for their own reasons, right? So are they becoming white? Or what's your perspective on that? Thank you. Kristen, thank you for showing up. And thank you for the kind words, I think, on the book, but also the criticisms. Um, I, I, I assigned it in part because of the creativity of the language, which I found really, really interesting. So we're going to talk about that. Kristen, Kristen, this is a fantastic question. Kristen, I don't really know how to answer this, actually. Um, but thank you. Um, I need to, do need to think about this. Where this is actually going is a project on the Atlantic that then is going to migrate kind of this is really this is really the introduction to whites are the enemies of heaven is kind of what I'm doing in this book. It really is necessary for us to to understand a lot of the things that I'm talking about there. I wasn't fully aware of that until I realized the absolute centrality of enslavement, black enslavement to this new climate regime. That again, the dialectical inextricability of black weathering whites climating happens before manifest destiny goes, goes into the Asia Pacific, goes into the Asia Pacific from the US, and of course comes the other way for, for the UK. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking. I don't really think the project is, is complete enough historically without this. Now, Kristen, what in fact I'm planning on doing with this book is to really jump over what I did in Whites of the Enemies of Heaven and end up with something I'm calling Blacks Weather, Blacks Weather, Chinese Climate. So that's the challenge I've given myself to this new project because I don't have, you and Nicole know, know this better than I do. I'm really an interloper into Chinese history. I do some of it, as you know, but 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 some of it isn't isn't as thorough as, as I would like. Um, really, these categories of race progress do come from European templates. They're modular, of course. They're transformed. They're rearticulated. But attitudes about race progress, Baconian science, etc., all come from Europeans. As do this I. I would say, as do ideas about the instrument, instrumentalization of nature. That's not to say that that doesn't exist in certain forms of Confucian or Neo-Confucian thinking. As you and Nicole know, um, there are there, but in some sense they become emergent, they become hegemonic really through this new formation of climate Caucasianism. To the extent where now we're seeing Again, we're seeing this formation that I'm going to try to argue in this book is uh, Chinese climating. We, Thank you. We now, have a, we now have a question from Shai Ginsberg. Um, it seems that you draw a map in which the brain is in Europe and the hands are in its colonies. Could you say a bit more of how what you're describing is manifested in Europe itself, industrialization, fossil mining, pollution. Who are the bodies in pain in Europe and how do you relate to the question of black weathering? Thank you for the question, Shai. Um, obviously, the, like mom points out, Jason, the world ecology paradigm supplies answers to this or eco-Marxism supplies the best answers for this. I won't bore anybody um, with reiterating some of their argument, but um, um, in general, this builds on what Miguel said earlier, the modernity coloniality paradigm. But what happens in terms of fossil capitalism in Europe is a class analysis only. So mom's work on fossil capital, it's completely groundbreaking. He emphasizes class only. What's happening at the same time, Shai, is primitive accumulation of fossil capital is happening on the bodies of enslaved blacks in the U.S. That's completely repressed, really, at least in mom's early work, and kind of, the, I'm trying to fill in some of those gaps. Um, Kant is explicit 
about mind and body differences. So it, what I call enlightenment philosophy is very explicit on this. The mind is located in European masculinity. The body is located in other places. That separation has to be secured for progress to move forward. And we have another raised hand from Nicole Barnes. Yeah, sorry. I, this is more a comment than anything. I just, I'm so struck by two things. One is, I'm sure, as you know, you know, the specter of the black slave had a profound effect on the Chinese from, you know, the late 18th century throughout the 20th. I mean, there, the drive for modernizing and profiting in a new geopolitical formation was to refuse the position of the Hei Nu, the black slave, and to make sure Chinese did not become that. <laughs> so I think that that's one way in which you can conceptualize the 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 push that enlightenment had on within China itself, you know, the, it, without the specter of the black slave, I think they might've operated very differently. <laughs> right. That's one thing. And then the other is just, I'm, it's so striking to me how brutally extractive, even the plans for, um, uh, these outlier so soil amendment people were like if they were thinking of guano that's through extractive enslaved coolie labor right <laughs> that's oh. still in the same kind of ex extra active extractive uh, idea that you describe i i actually don't think your 2020 book is a failure i like it very much but i like how this project is also enriching it and then you know like it it just doesn't occur to them like the, the use of human bones that's really disgusting and at the same time they're calling chinese farming practices which are very good stewardship of the land through recycling of night soil they're calling that disgusting and uncivilized and barbaric and pushing chinese to abandon that wow. so these are just ways that i'm offering as potential ways of thinking through this morass of concepts that you're trying to if you're trying to get to china uh, china's climate or whatever you called it it's kind of like the chinese are basically doing what the japanese empire did if we can't beat them we'll join them and we'll do it better than them right yeah nicole thank you that's fantastic Fantastically helpful. Thank you so much. That's really more than I had I had even 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 had on this issue. Yeah, this is great. Kristen Stapleton, I, I'm sorry I didn't recognize you. I love your work. So I just want to say I cite you at length in the last chapter of my book. So I just wanted to, I'm sorry I didn't recognize the name. Um, but no, yeah, no, thank you for your work. It's just, yeah, this is I apologize for not realizing who you were earlier. Um, uh, well, like no, no problem. I, uh, uh, you know, I became aware of you largely from this book that was sent to me to review. But, yeah. Um, yeah. but I, you know, just in response to what Nicole said, um, Frank Dakota, you know, you're going to have to deal with him, I think, because he definitely sees very strong uh, Chinese thinking that fed into a kind of racist view. And the black slave idea did figure in you know, elite worries, but I think Dakota would say, you know, but there's a lot of racism within China anyway, and very few people w actually learned about this image that the black slave that Nicole mentioned. So I just raised that as a, another thing to think about. Kristen, thank you. This is, yeah, no, I know I have a long response to the Dakota argument um, that comes from Tamu Roskula and David Eng, kind of my some of my close friends who we've discussed. Yeah, I have a long take on this, but thank you for reminding that. I do know that I, I actually teach this argument in my undergrad classes. Um, so thank you for that. Again, thank you for your work, Krista. My God, I hope you're happy with what I say about it uh, in the last chapter of uh, The Whites Are Enemies of Heaven. I'll be interested to, to see, but I learned a lot in. Um, uh, from your stuff. So again, thanks a lot. I'm looking forward to reading more of it. And Nicole, this is just great um, for reminding me about the late night. This is in Rebecca Carl's work, some of this stuff about the horror of becoming black or, um, you know, as, as you know, or Kristen, you know, what I try to do is to show that um, the kind of this dramatic inversion 
of the way the Chinese and Japanese are configured in European thinking happens in, my God, a short time, right? We're talking about a 50, 75 year change where, you know, Chinese is really looked up to. And Nicole, you're right about the, the scientific improvers in the US South, although some of them did recognize that, that chi chi Chinese agriculture superiority. So Nicole, I can send you some stuff on this. So it's not a complete rejection. I know that on the ground, there's of course an imperial hubris that looks down on everything that happens in China, but there are some theorists, slave white supremacist theorists who do respect what's happening in China. And that's just a continuation of stuff in enlightenment philosophy, right? Montesquieu, Voltaire, other places that saw the superiority in some forms of Chinese technoscience um, cultural organizations, etc. But again, how that flips to 50 years later, you get this really virulent white supremacy in the treaty after the first war, for, the first war on drugs, right? And so this is an incredible turnaround. But that's partly the way that I tried to work it. And whites are enemies of heaven is that's really carried by people from plantation societies. So some of the same people. You know, and of course, there's such a connection, as Lisa Lowe has argued, with the slave ships are used to carry the indentured laborers, right? The opium clippers are also used for all kinds of things. They're used in New Orleans. So it's impossible to really connect it. But what I wanted to show when whites are enemies is that this idea that came from plantation economies, sometimes the same people come into the Asia Pacific and physically carry this experience of black weathering and white climating to the new treaty port system in East Asia. So that, that was, you know, I wanted to make sure that that was foregrounded. But as you two are suggesting, it's a much more complicated story than that. But thank you so much for coming here. This is so much fun. I thought this was gonna be like a North Atlantic crowd. Um. I think if we have no more questions, I would like to thank Professor Driscoll and thank you to all the attendees who joined us today. Next week, Wednesdays at the Center continues with Duke historian Calvin Chung Miao, who will present Solidarity, Third Worldism and the Activist Origins of Asian American Studies. Thank you again, Professor Driscoll, and we Hope to see all of you next Wednesday. Have a great day. Thank, well, hey, you. thank you so much. Jean thank Gianluca, thanks so much again. It was so much fun. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. Bye, Bye Nicole. Bye, Kristen. <laughs>